take our Bibles and open them to Romans chapter 3. We're in Romans chapter 3 now. We're going to be picking it up in verse 9 tonight, looking at verses 9 through 20. 9 through 20 as we're moving along, and uh, we've been looking at the first chapter 1 and chapter 2 as that we've understood the total depravity of man. Paul has uh, definitely told us how sinful man is and depraved man is and his nature and how ungodly uh, they are and we are and uh, it kind of makes you feel real rotten, doesn't it, uh, there. But he has to tell the truth because that's what we are. And we're sinners that need to be saved by God's grace. And those of us who have, we understand the wonderful grace of God and His wonderful uh, um, grace and His wonderful mercy that He saved us. And so we get into chapter 3, and now He's talked with the Gentiles and their sin in chapter 1, the Jews and their sin in chapter 2, and then He starts out with chapter 3, and He starts talking about what advantage did the Jew have, and He goes on to explain that they had the law, they had the Word of God, they had everything given to them, and yet they still rejected that. And so he went on with that, and so several times, and three times, and just there alone, we saw God forbid, God forbid, God forbid. And we come down now to verse number 9, and now we're going to see uh, about the, the result of sin. As we take a look at beginning of verse 9 through 20, so the result of sin. And so we're going to see in the scriptures tonight as we look at three or four wonderful truths that give to us here in this. And uh, this is, uh, actually this is the scripture. The scripture is giving us a determination and determining that we are all sinners. And that we're all under sin. The scripture determines that. So the scripture is going to give us a determination of the scriptures. Number one here in verse number nine, we're going to look at the determination in the scriptures here, beginning in verse nine down here through a little ways. And so let's pray. Father, again, thank you for your time and your love to us. Thank you for the time in your word now. Once again, we need the Holy Spirit's help, his guidance, his direction in our lives, and as he directs us in the word of God. We ask for illumination, understanding, wisdom to apply it. And we ask for your anointing upon your word and your servant in this hour. And we'll thank you for it and praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. All right, let's look at the determination in the scriptures. First of all, verse number 9 says, what then? He says, are we better than they? This is Paul saying, are we better than the, 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 the Jew or the Jew better than the No, in no wise. For we have all, for we have before proved that both Jews and Gentiles, that they are all under sin. Okay, are we better than they? Are they better than us? No. You see, they thought they were better than the Gentiles in chapter 1, and Paul got them straight in chapter 2 that, no, no, you're just as bad as they are. You do the same things they do, and, you know, who are you to judge them because you're going to be judged by the same God. And so he kind of straightens them out on that. And we come over here to verse uh, num number 9 here in chapter 3 when he talked about the advantage that the Jew had over us that God gave to them and that they blew it. Basically, you remember in, in what we got in John 1.11, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. That's us. Aren't you glad you're part of that? But as many as received him. And glad you received him tonight. Glad you're not in verse 11, right? See, just like Alan's brother. Alan's brother had a visitation of the Lord on Wednesday. You see, the Lord came to him in the person of the Holy Spirit and that witness with him, and he rejected that, you see. The Lord came to him, and he rejected that. But then as many of us that have received him, praise the Lord. Amen. So we keep praying for his brother. Amen. And it's like this morning, we praise God for one that has called on Jesus to save him and, and wants to follow him in believer's baptism. Folks, anytime something like that happens in a church, we ought to be rejoicing and praising God. You see, and, and, and sometimes even if you've talked with him and, and dealt with him and you maybe you've seen him and you know, sometimes he does act a little different and, and so forth. And you say, you know, well, hey, aren't you glad God saves everybody Amen. that wants to be saved? Doesn't matter if you're different, what color you are, what language you speak. The gospel is for everyone who believes. And so 
Paul says, listen here, the Scripture, the Scripture has determined that all are under sin. That's what he's telling his audience here, both Jew and Gentile. So that both Jews and Gentiles are all under sin. Hey, there in your outline as we take a look at it. We're looking at verse 9 right now. And secondly, all people are under sin. See, there's some people out there that don't think they're a Jew or a Gentile. They think they're something else. So that's okay. The Bible says that all are under sin. So you're either a Jew or a Gentile tonight, one or the other. But hey, you can be whatever you want to be. You're still all, or all is all, right, church? All is under sin. Let's take a look at Galatians 3.22. Remember, the Scripture is determining this. And the Scripture is determining that we are all under sin. Galatians 3.22, the Apostle Paul writing to the church of Galatia says, But the Scripture, ah, here we go. But the Scripture hath what? Concluded all under sin. What is the Scripture determined and concluded? That we're all under sin. That the promise by faith, how many of you have the faith that Jesus, the promise of faith that God gave you, in Christ might be given to them that believe aren't you glad you got the promise of faith tonight because you believed so you ought to say amen to that you see but the scripture hath concluded all are under sin now since you've got your bibles uh, let's look at a few quotes on this let's go back to uh, uh, psalms chapter 14 first of all psalm chapter 14 right there in the middle of your bible and then we'll go to psalm 53 so if you get to 53 first hold your finger there if not go on to 14 and then find 53 psalm 53 and put your finger or marker in there, and we'll come right back to that. All right? Let's see a couple of passages in the Old Testament, because Paul said in Galatians that the Scripture hath concluded. When he's speaking of the Scripture, or he says it is written, he's speaking of the Old Testament. Because remember, all the New Testament hadn't been written yet, okay? So the Scripture, all right, well, let's go back to the Scripture and let's see what the Scripture has concluded. All right, everybody, in, in Psalms 14, let's look at verse number 1. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done, they have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. How many? The Scripture has concluded that none doeth good. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. Verse 3, they are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Paul's actually quoting here the Old Testament in Galatians. Now go to Psalm 53, if you would. Psalm 53. Everybody in 53 there. All right. Let's again read the first three verses. Again, almost exact repeat of Psalm 14. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. How in the world could you watch the eclipse here a week ago and say there was no God? How in the world can you go out at night and tonight when we get out of here, you'll still have an hour of sunlight and watch the sunset in a beautiful orange like it was the other night. It was beautiful. It was gorgeous. And say that there is no God. How can you go out here tonight and get in a dark place where there's no lights around? I mean, way out here in the country, someplace in the dark, and go outside and look into the sky and the stars and say that there is no God. How many could say, look the other night at that big, beautiful yellow moon that came up late? Man, that thing just came right up and sat right over my house, just like a spotlight. Now, I know he did on your house, too, but I'd like to say it was at my house. I mean, how could you go out there and say that there's not a God? But the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Okay, and we're reading in 53 verse 1. All right, corrupt are they, just like Psalm 14 almost. They have done abominable iniquity. There is none that doeth good. God looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand that did seek God. Every one of them is gone back. They are altogether become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. So we see where the Scripture now has determined and concluded that we're all under sin. This is what Paul's trying to get across to his audience. Matter of fact, look at verse 10, some of the verses we just read there. Verse 10 back in Romans says what? As it is written. All right, here we go. We're quoting the Old Testament. What did we just read in Psalms? That there is none righteous, no, not one. 
There's none righteous. Number one, none. No, not one is righteous. Verse 10. We just read that. Then we read there in Psalms that all have gone astray. Verses 10, 11, and 12 we see there is none that understandeth. We read that in the Psalms. There is none that seeketh after God. We read that in the Psalms. They are all gone out of their way. We read that in the Psalms. They are altogether become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. And by the way, that word uh, doeth there, anytime you remember when we add the E-T-H to it, the if, it becomes what? A present participle, which means a continual repeated action. So the Bible says, makes it very clear here, uh, there is none that continually doeth good, no, not one. See, folks, that's why nobody can say that their goodness is going to get them to heaven. That's why you're not going to get into heaven because of all the good things you do. Just like this morning, you can sit there and read that passage of Scripture. Now you're going to go out here and feed everybody, clothe everybody, and do all these good things to everybody, and think that's going to get you to heaven or earn heaven, and it is not. It's not. Turn to Isaiah with me. Get back to Isaiah with me, okay? Everybody go to Isaiah. There's only just a few Old Testament passages we'll look at, and then that'll be it, and we'll move on. Isaiah chapter 64 first. And then if you find the other one there, Isaiah 53, uh, hang in there and stay into that one because we'll be back to that. All right, Isaiah 64. Everybody in Isaiah 64? All right, let's take a look at Isaiah 64, verse number 7. And there is none that calleth upon thy name. How many? None. That stirreth up himself to take hold of thee. For thou, hast did, for thou hast hid thy face from us and hast consumed us because of our what? Iniquities. See, that's what be going astray means, your iniquities, all right? So then we read in verse 12 there, as you take a look in your study guide this evening, there is none who does good. Verse 12 says that. Back in Romans verse 12, keep your hand there all the time. They are all gone out of their way. We just read that. They are altogether become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Wow, my goodness. All right, and then the Bible says we are all like sheep have gone astray, right? While you're there in 64, look at verse 6. But we are all as unclean thing, and all of our righteousness are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as the leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. Oh, my goodness. Now go over to Isaiah 53. Back to Isaiah 53 with me. All right, just a few verses back. Isaiah 53. You all are real familiar with this chapter in Isaiah. It's a Bible within itself. Isaiah 53 and verse number 6. Are we like sheep have gone astray? Isn't that what we just looked at in Romans? We're all sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him, that is Jesus, the iniquity of us all. That is number three there. Look at it. We've all turned away to our own way. Where do we find that? Isaiah 53, 6. So you see, the Scripture determined, has determined uh, that and has concluded that we're all under sin. The Scripture has concluded and determined that there is none righteous, no, not one. The Scripture has uh, concluded and determined that we've all gone astray and that we, none of us are doing any good. Okay, Amen. And so, and we've all turned to our own way. See, and in these verses, we see the case of a sinful nature. All right, I don't know if you have that, but I'll give them to you, and you write them down if you need to. All right, do you have these, or you got blanks? All right, let's go. All right, so here we go. First one, A, unrighteous. Unrighteous. We're looking at the case of a sinful nature. B, ignorant. Based on these three verses, or 9, 10, 11, and 12, these four verses, especially 10 through 12, we're looking at the case of sinful nature. C, indifferent. And you didn't have to write the second word, selfish. All right. D, crooked. Crooked. E, useless, worthless. What you have there, the second word. F, evil. These three verses describe the sinful nature of man. That's why, so folks, we are totally depraved. Now, we have those that teach a doctrine that man is not totally depraved. And, and, and I feel for that because they're, they're in error. 
Okay, they're in error. That is false teaching. Man is totally depraved and has a totally depraved nature. Folks, if there was any good in us and there was any way we could get to heaven based on our merit, our good, our deeds, we didn't need Jesus. We wouldn't have needed a Savior. And God didn't put Jesus through all what he put him through because of our goodness. Okay, a matter of fact, if that was the case and Jesus had to go through everything he went through and all that he went through for us, everything, think about that, and yet we could still merit heaven based on our goodness, our self-righteousness, or anything else, that would be an insult to God and a slap in his face. That's simple. And so and God's not going to let that happen, amen? So Paul, the scripture reminds us here in verses 9, 10, 11, and 12, the scripture has determined that both Jews and Gentiles are all under sin. Okay, with me, say amen. amen. All right, now let's look at the declaration of sin. We've seen the determination in the scriptures. Let's look at the declaration of sin, verses 13 and 14 with me. And here we see the case of a sinful tongue. Hello, of a sinful tongue. That organ is in your mouth. Okay, the declaration of sin. All right, let's read 13 and 14. We'll come back and digest a little bit. Their throat, oh my, is an open sepulcher. With their tongues, with what? With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Now this is God's word describing the sinful nature of man. That's why we're all under sin, and there's none good, none righteous. We've gone all our own way and everything else. Can't get out of it. We can't get out of it. And so here we see the declaration of sin, the case of a sinful tongue. Number one, first of all, sin affects the human lips. Sin is going to affect your speech. Hello, you ready to write some down? Turn to Matthew with me before we write them down. All right, go to Matthew chapter 12. I think this is probably, no, we'll have one or two others to look up, and that'll be it. Matthew chapter 12 with me. Everybody, Matthew 12. Let's get back to Matthew chapter 12. All right. Let's take a look at Matthew 12 tonight. Matthew 12, beginning in verse number 34. All right, everybody, 1234? Okay, here we go. And 33 starts talking about the tree is known for its fruits, okay? O generation of vipers, <laughs> now don't get upset if I say something Jesus calling you vipers I mean he didn't beat around the bush with these Pharisees did he oh generation of vipers how can ye being evil speak good things for out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh a good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things but I say unto you that every idle word that a man shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Boy, that's some strong language. So let's take a look at this. Sin, sin here affects our human speech. Number one, force and corrupt. And that's what we're reading here in Matthew chapter 12. It's, our speech is force and corrupt. We read in there that our speech is deceitful. Number two, deceitful. We read in there that our lips are piercing and poisonous. The poisonous of an asp is under. Do you know what an asp is over there in, in the Middle East? That's the most poisonous snake on the planet. And what's interesting is Jesus said, this is what really is a killer, man. I mean, the Lord's got, I guess, a sense of humor to one, one sense or another. Uh, I think sometimes it might be a little dry of sense of humor, all right, because I know how I am with snakes. But in the millennium, in the millennium, Jesus said that the children, the children are going to play over the hole of an asp. They're going to play with them. They're going to be their pets. Well, if the kids have got those out, I'm leaving. You know, I, I'm not going to have a kid's ministry in the millennium with ass snakes running around the auditorium. Because then we really will have revival. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> but I mean, the, the, he says there's poison in our lips because of our sinful nature. Okay, it's, our, our lips are deceitful. And then he said, we read there in Matthew, nothing but cursing and bitterness comes out. 
Folks, today you can hardly talk to a person on the street or in the store that can't speak a sentence without three or four curse words. I mean, every other word is a swear word. I've even heard children outcuss their parents. And, and, and the parents laugh at that. I mean, this shows you, you see, the, 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 the total depravity of man. And you say, well, that's a man. Hey, look at the total depravity of a six-year-old that cusses his parents out. See, he's just as depraved as the, the adult is. Because why? We're all under sin. Even the children. Till they come to an age of accountability. And only the Lord knows that. I don't, so I'll leave that up to him. Amen. So sin affects our lips. Now we get to verses 15 and 18. See, we're moving right along in here tonight. All right, verses 15 and 18. Everybody there with me? All right, let's read 15 through 18. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known, and there is no fear of God before their eyes. Now that fear there, he's not talking about a healthy, respectful fear for God. He's talking about a disrespect for God. And I'll tell you, the way a lot of believers do live today even, there's no fear of God in their heart and life. There, there really isn't. And, and folks, so, so as we see sin affects the human lips, what else do we notice? Sin affects living actions. Living actions. Now due to time here, I'm going to just... Now hang on here. Well, there's Psalms 10 7, and you have it there. You can look it up later. It, Psalms 10 7 speaks to that. And then notice he said, Their feet to shed blood. In other words, they're murderous. Murderers. And I want to tell you something the spirit of murder is in our country. The spirit of murder is in our country. I was reading here just recently on, on a poll was taken, and that there are eight murders committed every hour. In the United States. Eight murders every hour. I'm talking cold-blooded murder. But let's not get too hard on that. Let's look at the 54 million babies we've killed in America. That's murder. They have shed innocent blood. They talk about rights. Where's the right of the unborn child? You talk about choice. That child never had a right to make a choice, did they? Sin affects how we live, church. And it affects us to the point that there are those that just simply run to murder. Uh, sin affects the way we live because it's very depressive. It causes misery, verse 16 says there. Destruction and misery are in their ways. Then it talks about, verse 17 says there, and their way of peace have they not known. In other words, they're restless, they're disturbing, they're warring. I mean, we see that going on right now. Not just in, our, in the countries or the foreign countries, folks, that we're seeing what's happened. But you know, there's war going right on here in America. We've got all kinds of ethnic groups that are against each other. Man, we got, we got, the, we got gangs all over the place. We've got sleeper cells all over the place. We've got the, uh, the, the radical, radicalists are, are all over the place in this country. And, and, and we got the, the gangs are fighting each other. I mean, Constantly. The blacks are fighting the Hispanics, the Hispanics are fighting the blacks, the Puerto Ricans, the Cubans, and on and on, and the Americans, and the skinheads, and all that stuff. And just it's constant murder going in here. And because why? There's no peace. They don't want any peace. So they're restless, and they're disturbing, and they're warring against each other. This is, again, Paul's pointing out here of the total depravity of man that we're all under sin, whether you're a Gentile or a Jew. Because the scripture says so. The scripture has concluded. So then he says, well, notice what else it says here. And in verse 18, let's read it again. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now that's the one that really gets me alarmed. That's why people out here doing whatever they want, they don't fear God. Maybe we need the Lord to do a little bit like he did in the Old Testament. Dealt with it immediately. 
Now we need to de- get him to do a little dealing with it in the church today. We got believers today, even in the church, that just live like the devil themselves because there's no fear of God. They don't believe that God's going to do anything. They can get by with it and get away with it. It's not going to matter and so forth. My friend, may I remind you, if you are saved, God will deal with you. And God will not let it go unpunished and, and so forth. The Bible makes that very clear in Hebrews. Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth. And every, as we are all sons, if we're sons and daughters, we're partakers of that discipline and chastening in our lives when we're disobedient. And then he says, if you were without chastening, without chastisement, then he said, you are, not, you are bastards and not sons. You're illegitimate. You're not saved. Amen. That's why a lot of believers out here quote, I say believers, wondering, well, how come nothing's happened to me? God hasn't disciplined me. I'm not going through anything. Well, maybe it's because you're not saved. But guess what? God will one day in the judgment. It will come. And the believer, I tell you what, God lets us get away a little bit, doesn't he? You know, we all have a little rope he lets us run until we almost hang ourselves. He's long-suffering and patient towards us, he says. And thank God for his mercy. But either eventually, he's going to deal with you. Anybody in here been spanked by the Lord? Come on. Anybody been spanked? Yeah, come on. We've all been disciplined a time or two by the Lord. And it's, it's, it's a nice thing to know that we, when it is, we realize that, right? That's another thing I have. A lot of pre- even believers that are, they don't think they're being disciplined. They think they're suffering for Jesus. And here they are how they're living in sin and living like the devil. And they go through some type of chastening or chastisement in their life or something happens. And all of a sudden, they think they're being persecuted for Jesus. When the Lord is chastening them. Boy, anytime things go, aren't too pleasant, saw or goes on, that's the first thing. Okay, Lord, talk to me. Amen. Search my heart. Know me. See if there be any wicked ways David did. Something I've done or something I'm not doing that's not pleasing you. I mean, what is it? And I want to make sure we've got a clear path here. And so if it's not any of those things, then I'm going to say, okay, then I have to accept what you're doing here is for my good and for discipline for your glory. And it's to bring you glory, and it's not discipline, but it's to bring you glory. And so, you know, you have to decide that and decipher that between you and the Holy Spirit and God, all right? But if you want to talk about the the godless, irreverent, disrespectful, verse 18, number four. They are godless, they're irreverent, and they're disrespectful. They have no fear for the Lord. Go back and read Isaiah 59, verses 7 and 8, 6, 7, 8, 9 in there. And Isaiah talks about that very thing and, and lays down some heavy scripture on that. Because remember, Paul said, the scripture hath concluded. So we're looking here at the determination. The scripture has determined that we're all under sin. Amen. That our lips are sin occasionally. Our lives and living sin occasionally as believers. There's no perfect person here tonight. And there's no sinless person here tonight. Amen. But by my goodness, folks, we ought not go out here and live like it and act like it. Well, look at verse 19. Ah, the destruction. Verse 19, we come to the destruction. Only two verses left. All right, so hang in here with me. This is the case of the law. Now we're going to get down to some nitty-gritty stuff here. All right. The case of the law. Now, notice what he says, present tense. We know. Paul says, all right, what do we know? We know that what things soever the law saith... It saith to them who are under the law. So who's under the law? The Jews were, right? Okay, are you with me? That every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Let's read it again. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, It saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. So let's look at the case of the law, the judge's sentence. The judge is going to pass down a sentence, and who's the judge? The Lord Jesus Christ, amen? He's the judge, and he's going to pass down the sentence here in verse 19b. And what is that sentence? All the world may become guilty before God. There's the sentence. What was the thing he said? Every mouth may be stopped. 
every mouth may be stopped. And we just talked about that with our lips and four things there. When we talk about every mouth here, we're talking about, I can name some things here. Uh, human excuses. You're going to be without excuse when you stand before the Lord. There are no excuses. We already read that in the previous chapters, that we're without excuse. There'll be no excuse. And so every mouth will be stopped. So the human that's going to stand before God, you're going to have no excuses. They're going to stop right there. Human accusations. You know, you're not going to have any accusations, you see. And how many people want to blame everybody else for everything else, and they don't want to take the accountability for themselves and responsibility for their own actions, so they want to accuse everybody else. But the Bible says your mouth is going to be stopped. Because why? You're guilty. And what about those that rationalize everything? Oh, my goodness, they rationalize anything and everything, the way they live, the way they act. I mean, you name it. And then human justifications. Boy, everybody wants to justify everything they do. You see, but see, your justification doesn't count. Only God's does. My justification doesn't count. Only God's does. By the way, you see, number three there, only God's law will matter. And that's God's moral law. And then we, again, we find it, number four, it says here right in the Bible, it says that all the world is guilty before God. All the world. Well, we come to verse 20. We're still with the judge here. Therefore, don't miss this for all you law people out there. Are you with me? Amen. My Barbara is one of them. One of the actors that you know that was very pr prominent in many of the faith films we watched, especially on the Left Behind series. And especially in some of the Hendrix brothers uh, from the Sherwood uh, productions that we saw. It is big on the law. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is known is the knowledge of sin. So let's look at that for just a moment here. The judge's sentence again, talking about unjustified flesh. That no flesh is justified by the works or the deeds of the law. Folks, you can't get any plainer than this right here. And, and there are people that will simply say, you know, you've got to obey the Ten Commandments. James 2.10 says if you've, if you've messed up in one point, you're guilty of all. And, and the law we're talking about here now is, is, is the Moses' law, the Mosaic law, the, 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 the five, first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Mo, Moses was the lawgiver, and grace came by Christ. Hallelujah. So let's take a look at the law. The judge's sentence, unjustified flesh. No person is justified by the works or the deeds of the law. Are you with me, church? I don't care how much work you do, how much good things you do or good deeds you do, what you join, what you sign up, what you get involved in. If you're counting on that or thinking about that or hoping that that's going to get you into heaven or merit heaven, it will not. No flesh is, ju what's justified mean? It means made right, made holy, made righteous. Or we can put it in simpler terms, saved. You're not saved by works. You're not saved by deeds. You're not made right. That's what justification is. When you get saved and born again, God justifies you. In other words, makes you righteous. You stand righteous before God. Therefore, it's just as if you've never sinned. No person, I'm going to keep dwelling on this, so you're watching there with us. No person is justified by the deeds or the works of the law. In other words, one cannot earn being justified in God's sight. You cannot earn your salvation. You cannot merit your salvation by works or deeds or anything else you do because the Bible says, has concluded, here we go again, that no flesh is justified by the deeds or the works of the law. No flesh is made righteous or saved. Okay? You can't earn it. Matter of fact, learning the law of Moses, 
That's what he talked about there. By the law is the knowledge of sin. That's the first five books of the Pentateuch. That's what the law does. The law shows us our sin. The law points out our sin. The law condemns our sin. And the punishment for that is death. Why would you want to go by the law? Because that's death. I'd rather come by grace in Christ and have life. Amen. Amen huh? Come on now. Help me out here. So you see, you can learn the, the law of Moses all you want to. And the result is, it, is that you're just going to have knowledge of your sin. The law is going to point out your sin and my sin. That's basically what we've been looking at here. But that's not going to save you, justify you. It's the schoolmaster. Law brings, uh, takes us to the school and brings us to the schoolmaster and points us to Christ. That's why Jesus said, I haven't come to destroy the law, but I have come to fulfill the law. And what did the law demand? The death penalty. Amen. So who paid the death penalty? Jesus did. Amen. So folks, you're not going to get saved by doing all these good things and good deeds and works and all this and all that. Because again, that's, a, that's an insult to God. Because if that's the case, we didn't need Jesus. The law points out our sin so that we do need a Savior. That's why it shows us our sin, that we're, we're totally depraved. And we need a Savior to take care of it. Because we can't. Now here's the thing. You can go on and on like Alan's brother. Unfortunately, I hope that he doesn't. And you can go on and on and just keep rejecting Christ. And sooner or later, you're going to pay for it. When Christ has already paid for it. Amen. My goodness. All right, so we find here. So we can't. Let's see. The judge's sentence again. All right, the judge is going to give us another sentence. Are you ready? All right, here we go. Here it is. He condemns knowledge. He condemns knowledge, the judge does. That's what he said there in the bottom part of verse 20. Justified. The question is, justified. Justified means made just or holy in God's sight. And the law is not going to do that. We read that. See, salvation is not of works, lest any man should boast. How many of you know what Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 says? For by grace, say it with me, for by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Okay? So salvation is not of works. It's not of the deeds. It's not of keeping the law. Why? Because in Romans 6, 23, the Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. Death. Humans are not justified by the works of the law. Now you just read that here in Romans, right? Therefore, by the deeds or the works of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. That's God's sight. Now, let's go back to Galatians chapter 2 and verse 16. It's in your notes. Knowing. Come on, something. talk, talk to me. All right, we know something here, right? What are we going to know? That a man is not justified by the works or the deeds of the law. Then how is a man justified? By the faith of Jesus Christ. To who? To even them that believe in Jesus Christ. That we might be justified, saved, made righteous, made holy. How? By the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. Folks, it don't get any plainer than this. Okay? For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. And I have gone over this with people, and they just don't get it. Folks, why can't you just accept what God's done for you? And give him the praise and credit. No, but you see, some high, man is so prideful and so full of pride, and he wants to boast and brag about it, and everybody's going to strut around heaven all, and look what I did to get here. Well, no, I'm sorry, you're not going to get there if that's what you're counting on. Not going to be any braggers or boasters or, or many roosters or peacocks or, or trumpet blowers in heaven. Amen? No, sir. So let's get to the conclusion, and we're done this evening. The conclusion. Justified in God's eyes. How am I justified in God's eyes? Because we've just been talking about that and we read that. By the faith of Jesus Christ. We just read that in Galatians 
Okay? So let's talk about death and life then, all right? Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. Come on, my favorite words here. What? I am crucified. What? That's death. Right? Nevertheless, I live. That's life. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Life. Jesus' life lives in me. You see. And the life which I now live in the flesh here it is. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. No law. All credit and glory goes to God. That's why Revelation says in 3.20, and I know what this is in text to, in the text of it, and I know we like to use it much for soul winning. Nothing wrong with that. But in this passage here, Revelation 3.20, we see a picture of Jesus standing outside the door of the church of Philadelphia, the brotherly love church in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. And we see him standing outside the door of the church, knocking on the door of the church, wanting to come in and have fellowship with the church. I will use the same thing in soul winning. Tonight, some of you that are listening and watching by way of Rumble Live, God bless you. Thanks for being with us tonight. Praise the Lord. Amen. We love you. Thanks for tuning in with us. Thank you for the wonderful response this morning. My goodness, you just blew my socks off my feet. You really did. God bless you. Thank you so much. All right, but I want to tell you something. If you're not saved and you don't know the Lord, Jesus right now, because of the Word of God tonight, the Spirit of God is working. He's standing at your heart's door tonight, and He's knocking on it. He's a perfect gentleman. He will not force himself in. He will not break down the door or barge it down. He's perfectly gentleman and courteous. He's knocking at the heart of your door tonight, and he's wanting you to open. You have to open the door. He's not going to kick it down and knock it down. You have to open the door. And if you are willing to open that door, Jesus is more than willing to come into your life and to fellowship with you and to be your Lord and your Savior if you're lost. But the same thing to us that are saved, because he's knocking at the door of the Church of Philadelphia there in Revelation. And he's wanting to come in. And that's just like what here, folks. In the morning when the service starts out here, the Lord's the first person here. Or he waits till we all get here. And he's out there knocking on the door. And he wants us to open the door and let him in. And he wants to come in in fellowship with us. And I want to say and put it on record, the Lord is welcome in this place. The Holy Spirit is welcome in this place. God the Father's welcomed in this place. The Trinity's welcomed in this place. And Lord, you don't have to knock on the door. It's open. Come on in. Amen. We'd love to have you in your presence here. But that's what he's doing. And that's what we want, church. We've come here to have fellowship with the Lord. And how sad it would be that he would have to stand out there and bang on the door and wait for one of us to open it. Boy, I tell you what. We'd have a revival if the Lord ever did that. It shocked the socks off of all of us. Who's knocking out there on the door? I don't know. I see a figure. Ted, you see him in the camera up there? Who's out there? Ted, I say, I don't know, but, Pastor, I don't know. I've never seen the Lord in person, but, man, the pictures I've seen, it looks like the Lord. I said, then somebody jump down there and do it and open that door. Now, he may have a bad hit, but I bet he'll fly down the stairs. Forget this, forget this slow-motion chair we got here that takes an hour to get down there. He'd, have, he'd be down there in the leap like a superman, and he'd open the door. And I guarantee you if it was the Lord, he'd probably have a heart attack first right there. But if not, Lord, come in. You are welcome. Come into our church today. Glad to have you. Welcome to our service. Now, folks, that's what we ought to do. God stands at the door of our heart tonight, and he knocks. And he says, I want to come in and have fellowship with you. And if you will open that door, I will. I will come in and fellowship with you and you with me. What a privilege to have fellowship with the Lord. What a privilege that he would choose our church to come and have fellowship with us on Sunday morning and tonight while we're here. May I remind us where two or more are gathered in his name, he is in the midst. So whether you realize it or not, the Lord is here tonight. The Spirit of God is in this place. He's come to fellowship with us. And he probably has come to check me out to see if I'm teaching right. And so after on the way home, he talks to me. When I'm sleeping at bed at night, he goes over with me in my mind. You wonder sometimes what I'm doing down here praying in the invitation. 
I'm praying for people sitting out here in the audience. I see their faces while I'm preaching. I see sometimes the conviction of the Holy Spirit come upon them. And I'm praying for God and the Spirit of God to speak to their hearts. And I'm thanking the Lord for the wonderful service. And the first thing I just said, Lord, man, thank you. You got me through this one this morning. Couldn't have done it without you. And then I'd say, Lord, I, I, I really, I hope I pleased you this morning because I want to please you. And, and I, I trust that I've did the best I can do, Lord, that's within me to interpret it and make it clear and understandable. So, Lord, I hope I've done a good job for you today. I mean, I really do, and I, and I mean that with all my heart. And then, Lord, deal with all of our hearts today. Lord, there may be somebody here who's not saved, and I got up, and here comes ever down the aisle. I'm going, whoa. All right. He got down here, and he knelt down, so I knew something was going on. I said, Brother Pat, would you come and deal with him? He came immediately. Thank you for responding immediately. You shouldn't have to beg. And I look around to see who I could call that I feel could work or handle the situation. And immediately, Pat, would you mind coming and dealing with this man so we can get that taken care of? And, you know, I, I thanked him as he walked by me, and I have confidence that he'll do a, a good job and know what's to do, what's right. And that's, that's a blessing. That's confidence. And our men, I thought of some other men. I don't know if any of you all know it, but Bob over here, who is uh, with Beverly, Bob's a deacon in his home church. His son is the pastor of his church there in New Hampshire. George Baker is usually here. He's an ordained deacon. Ted's a deacon, but he's up there. So I can't call on him. And others that may be here. And so I, I hope that our men would make themselves available as people begin to come to the altar. We're going to need people to deal with them. And we need people that know how to take the Bible and the Word of God and, and counsel with them and show them in the Scriptures how they need to be saved. Just don't say, okay, you come to be saved, great, amen, let's pray. Folks, they need to have a little bit of understanding of what they're doing. They need to understand that they're a sinner and that they're lost and they need a Savior. And they need to understand that they're down here and they're repenting of their sin. And they're turning from their sin and now they're turning to Christ in faith. And you need people that can do that and go through that and share that. We don't want anybody going out of here with a false sense of being saved and they're not. Well, I said a prayer. I mean, isn't that good enough? Well, sometimes it is. God knows the hearts of people. But I think we have a little bit too much of shallow salvations today that, I don't know, it's, it's questionable. The thief on the cross, he didn't have a choice, did he? In a few hours, he's going to be stone dead. But God knew his heart. But you see, we don't all have that. I've led some folks to Christ in deathbed confessions. And do you believe that they were saved? Hey, all I know is they prayed with me. They didn't have time. They had a few hours left, some of them less than that. They said, I know I'm dying. I'm going to die in a few minutes here, whatever. And I, I need to be saved. And would you help me before I die? Amen. And now guess what, folks? You've got a few minutes, and I don't know when he's going to have or she the next breath. I don't have the time to go through Genesis to Revelation and teach them the Word of God. Amen? Amen. But if they have a longing in their heart, and, and God has been stealing with them and speaking to them, and they know that they're dying and going to face the Lord, hey, I need to get saved. So what do I got to do to get saved? I know a Philippian jailer that asked that one time to Paul and them. and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And thy house. And 42 of his household members got saved. That's pretty good, isn't it, for being in prison? So let's keep this thought in mind. Works doesn't save us. Deeds, works, good things, don't, and that we're all under the law of sin. But thank God, those of us tonight, we're not under condemnation. Therefore, to them that are now in, in Christ, they're under no condemnation. To them that are in Christ, we're now, now, now under the judgment. That's in Romans 8, chapter 1. We'll get there sooner or later. Amen. But thank God now we're, instead of lost sinners, we're saved sinners. And we're not saved because we've been good. 
because we've joined the fundamental independent King James Bible preaching church. We're not saved because we're Baptists. We're saved because of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're changed because of His mercy and His grace. And we're justified. We've been made holy. We've been made righteous by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and faith in Christ. And God has made us righteous. The only righteousness we have is the righteousness of Christ. Saul, when you got saved and you trusted Christ, immediately God clothed you. He clothed you in the righteousness of Christ and made you righteous. So as you stand before God, you stand righteous before God, just as if you've never sinned a sin in your life. And when God goes and passes through, he says, when I see the blood, I'll pass. And when God looks at us, he sees the blood. We're covered in the blood. So aren't you glad we don't have to keep the law? Because you know why? We couldn't do it if we wanted to. Nobody's been able to keep the law. Not even the Pharisees. Those rascals broke it every time you turned around. Think about that. Nearly everything they did to Jesus, he came against him, they broke their own law. And James says, if you've offended in one point, you're guilty of all. That's in James chapter 2, verse 10. So you want to go look it up later. So, time to go home. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Lord. Showing us what we are, what we're like. You see? See, I told you, the first three chapters are a little rough. But when we get to chapter 4, 5 and 6, we're going to start dancing. You're going to get happy. Because now that you understand what we were and what we were and how we were and all that kind of stuff, and the Bible pointed it out to us, when we get to chapter 4, it starts changing. We're going to flip the other side of the coin, and we're going to start shouting. It's shouting time. Amen. Father, thank you for tonight. We love you. We praise you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for revealing to us through your word, the Lord, how we were and what we were. But we thank you that as Paul says several times in his letters and his epistles to the other churches, he says, but sometimes you were these things, but now you're washed in the blood, redeemed, forgiven. We thank you for that through the blood of Jesus Christ. Father, thank you that we're not under the law, but we're under grace. Now, we still obey the laws of God, His moral laws, Ten Commandments. They're still for us to follow and obey. But yet, Lord, we do fail at times. But we thank you we can come to you for forgiveness and ask for your forgiveness and cleansing, and you freely forgive us. And we thank you for that. We thank you for the blood of Christ tonight that cleanses us from all sin. We thank you for faith we have in Christ tonight that has redeemed us. And now we are justified by the faith in Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise the Lord.